the relief is that you already have everything you need to build your future. It just looks like something else right now. Hey, Creating Maven. I'm Joy Spencer, your reframe specialist with one important message. Your real work, it's not your job or your career. Your real work is what you create. And what you create is what sets you apart and makes you incomparable. It's your legacy. I'm here to show you a whole new way of working so you can create with your gifts, make a unique contribution, and finally get paid to be yourself. This is Reframe to Create. Do you wish you had something more? Maybe another skill, another personality, another set of talents. Maybe you wish this because you see other people with those skills and talents doing what you'd like to do. And you think, hmm, they can do that stuff because of what they have. And if I had that stuff or some other stuff, I'd be able to do it in other things too. So with that belief, you're getting ready to take another class, get another degree, do another whatever, add another tool to your toolkit, something, anything. You're running yourself ragged, looking to add something else to your plate. And how does that feel? How do you feel? Frazzled, tired, exhausted with the endless pursuit? Yeah, it's it's a lot, isn't it? But what if what if you believed that you already had everything you need right now? to do what you're here to do. What if you said, that's it. No more getting things. We're gonna make do with what we have. What do you think you could create? Do you think it would be, could be amazing still? Maybe something you've never imagined before. This idea is what my guest Hans Hansen and I dig into in this episode. Hans is an associate professor of management at Texas Tech and the author of Narrative Change, How Changing the Story Can Transform Society, Business, and Ourselves. This episode is part two of an interview with Hans, who joined us in episode 59 to share his nuggets on what we get wrong about all types of transformation, whether it's transformation in society, in organizations, or even in ourselves. And where we last left off with him was where he was getting us to the root of our wrong thinking on transformation and giving us the reframe that's the key to getting it right. If you haven't listened to it, this is a great point to stop and go back and listen to episode 59. Then come back and join us for the conclusion in this episode. So what is it, according to Hans, that we get so wrong about transformation? Well, It's the fact that we underestimate the real powerful sway of our existing narratives. The scripts we're already living by, and we all have scripts we're living by already, whether we know it or not, that's a given. In our eagerness to transform, we think we can just up and change the status quo. We think we that all that we need is a better, grander, newer vision of the future, something aspirational and inspirational to aim at, that we can be, you know, then we can just be off to the races. But Hans shows us how faulty this thinking is and that if we don't deal with the fact that the old us, the old narratives are still alive and kicking and that they're still being enacted and that they can be a direct barrier to where we want to go, then we're, we're going to miss a lot of things. And if we don't acknowledge this or if we treat it too lightly, we'll keep tripping over ourselves and getting nowhere. The status quo doesn't just live, y'all. It is powerful, very, very powerful. And that power must be acknowledged if it's going to be dealt with. Only then can we start taking it apart or deconstructing it. But what do we do once we've deconstructed these old narratives? We can't just be, you know, out here (laughs) narrativeless. What do we do to reconstruct the new one so that we can transform our businesses, our organizations, society, and ourselves? These are the specifics that Hans and I get into in this episode. This is a problem of how we think that the mater- we, are, we are much more innovative than we think. And I like your term reframing because it is a reuse. So I ask my students in class, if we take about this table, what could we make? Like, what else could we make if we deconstruct this table and just have all the supplies? And they often come up with things like, oh, we can make a bookcase or we can make a chair or we can make a smaller table. 
I'm like, slow down. You're kind of wowing me. But the problem is, is that those materials were already assigned to a category of furniture. So they cannot get out of the realm of furniture. And when I say, can we make a surfboard out of the table? That's mind blowing for them, but you can do a lot with the old material, but we are limited to the material we currently have. But I can tell you, it's also all that we need. This is, this is definitely giving me a lot of, of, of hope because sometimes, and I think a lot of us, sometimes when we're, when we're trying to be different or do different, we can feel a little down on ourselves uh, and limited by who we are and, and what we have available to us. And, and, you know, you can wish you had something else, what you had, what other people had, or you wish you had what other, other organizations had or other resources, you know, it's out there to go get it, but you're showing us that we already have what we need. It's about being willing to deconstruct and reconstruct it in a new way. Even the, what you were just talking about is an old narrative. That's like from an engineering mindset that we think, okay, here's where we want to go. And here's what I have. And then here's the stuff I need. Like I need this and I need to go get this and I need to go get that. So we do feel this sense of lack of all the things that I don't have that I need to build this new future. But if you already know you're limited to the stuff you have, and then the problem becomes different. How do you reassemble? So here's your future. Here's what you have. And then here's your list of things you need to get there. Crumple up that list of things you need. You've got what you've got. How do you use this to get to where you want to go? When you switch your mind from looking at this, what do I need uh, to get? So you have this goal of here's where I want to go and what do I need to get there? If you accept the constraint that you already have everything you need to get there, you're just going to have to get there with what you've already got. That's bad news, but that's good news because then you think, well, if I'm limited to all the materials I already have, if I have to get there with what I've got, I'm going to have to use it in a different way. I'm going to have to really reassemble it. That's part of what gets us over this. That's a deconstruction, right? Because you thought the, the way you use the things were the only way they could be used. But you can use your talent, skills, knowledge in a new way. This is called functional fixing this that we think, oh, those materials. It's called, say that again. It's called functional what? Functional fixedness, meaning that those things that I was using, like my shoe can only be used as a shoe. I can't use it as a hammer. If there's a nail up, I got I, I to gotta go get a hammer. That's what I need. And then someone says, nope, all you've got is what you're wearing. And you say, well, I'm going to have to use my shoe as a hammer. I'm going to have to turn it around and use the heel to smack that nail down. And all of a sudden, your shoe isn't a shoe anymore. You've deconstructed that, and now it's a hammer also. And then you start to realize, hey, I can start to use, I can figure out a way to take everything I've got and get where I need to go, but I'm going to have to use it in a new way or assemble it in a new way. So it's, it's sort of turning what you think are your limitations and realizing that they really, that you, that you have enough and that they're really, they're, that it really moving from the scarcity mindset to an abundance mindset. Like it's enough. Everything's enough. I have, I have what I need. Um, to get to where I need to go. Let's get about deconstructing, reconstructing and getting there. It's a bricolage mindset. I don't want to think of it like it's a, a mindset of it's, it's enough because doing the work to reassemble is a lot of work. So, but imagine a cooking metaphor. One way to approach a meal is to say, what would you like to eat? And then let's go get all of that stuff. The other way is to open your fridge and take everything out and say, what can we make with this? that we already have. Mm -hmm. And they have cooking shows that do that. And chefs make amazing meals because they're like, you know, I think sometimes the point of the show is to give them only like five or six ingredients and then just say, go nuts with this stuff. And while they can think about, oh, I would like to go get a piece of steak or I would like to do this, they switch from, okay, what can I do with what do I have in front of me? And they can make something amazing with what they have in front of them. And that's what you call the bricolage mindset? That's a bricolage approach to think about and in entrepreneurship they call it effectuation so it's how can i do what i want to achieve with the stuff i've already got and it gets you out of this mindset that you need to go get something or you need to go meet somebody or do all this stuff so i, I mean the vibe is kind of you got to be your own hero no one is coming you're limited to everything you've got you can see what can i i mean here's also an effect effectuation is to instead of thinking of the goal you look at all the materials you have and say what can I make with this? 
I like that because I know I've, I've been with and worked with a lot of folks who that's why they're, they're stuck. They're stuck because they're waiting for a better time, another place, other resources, a different job. They're waiting for something different or, or feel like they have to do something different that's a precursor to the thing. And this is just a, com a completely different way of looking at it. Of like, you've got the vision, now write the script on our way there. And all the materials and things that you're using for the script is with things that you have now. That's exactly right. So if they're stuck, it's because they are thinking about what they have to get to do the thing they want to do. The other approach is to say, put out on the table everything you've already got. What can you do with this? How far can you get? And you actually may create a different goal if you start with the materials you have. So someone might think, oh, I, I'm a copy editor. I can do this. I can illustrate. And you think, what can you do with that stuff? And the goal that you think of when you start with your, what can I do with my ingredients instead of start with the, the meal, you might make something better than you would have planned. That's the first part. You have to take all those things and think about narrate how you're going to use them. Or tell me the story about how what you have is going to get you somewhere. It's a cook it's a scripted cooking show. You have to have the script, you know, to get you there to the vision. But it, but it, but we're cooking and we're and we're working with the ingredients that are in in our in our kitchen already. You you start with what you've got, yeah, and you can recraft a whole. There's a million things you could cook with five ingredients. If you have a goal in mind and think about what do I need to get there, if you are hung up on that. All you will see is the gaps, like I've got to get my degree in this before I can get a, that job, or I have to do this before I can get that job. Now, you that might be true that you need like uh, to be certified as a nurse to do nursing. But if you look at what you have and think, what kind of story can I create with this material? It might not be nursing, but it could be something better. And it's going to be something achievable because you can narrate it or you can tell me the story starting with the materials that you have. Now, this is not to say that we can't go get stuff. I'm not saying people can't become a registered nurse if they want to get into nursing, but they can start sooner than they think. Mm -hmm. How how have you seen this play out for people or maybe like some of your students? The biggest thing they get out is to see some narrative that is confining their behaviors because they think in a certain way and then they just drop that way of thinking. So they're free of a way that they... Uh, well, here's one that they wanted to be an entrepreneur, but they kept thinking they had to wait to get this and to get this and to get that before they could open their business. Whereas they start with, uh, because they had nothing, right? But we think what, they desperately wanted to own their own business, but thought they had to get this, this, and this. They had a whole list of things they didn't have that they needed to do their business. But they started to think, what can I start with nothing? What business can you start with nothing? or with what I have. And it's not the business they might've thought, but they can start something and then build on that. Well, it's, a, it's a completely different way of thinking. Just realizing that they were constraining their own actions because uh, they were going by this narrative of looking at the, they could not plot out with the things they had, how they were going to get to where they wanted to be, but they could write some other story about what can they achieve with the, what you've got right now. It reminds me of one of um, the leaders I was working with once and we worked on her story and the theme of her story ended up being, don't let the title that you don't have stop you from being the leader that you already are. And it was sort of a story of how she, she I think I'm trying to remember, she was part of the color guard and had wanted to be captain and she didn't end up making captain, her best friend did, but she decided to be like the best co-captain or, you know, she, she really played full out anyway in that year and was still a leader in all intents and purposes. And the same played out for her as a foster a mom. They, they couldn't be parents, but they were still parents to foster kids that they had. And then they were able to adopt those kids. But in both those examples, she was being and demonstrating the thing that she wanted to be long before she got the title. She didn't say, well, I need to wait. I need to get this thing. I need to get all these things before I can start you know, being that or acting that way. She used what she had, which was her, her care, her commitment, and all of those things to move forward and end up in a different place than she might have thought before. That's a great example because her narrative was going to be, once I'm a captain, I can be a leader. Mm -hmm. But the new, she deconstructed that and said, hey, I can be a leader right now. It just won't be as a captain. So you realize 
And then she might have this reflection. This is the deconstruction of the epiphany. I don't want to be a captain. What I really want to be is a leader. And I can do that today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's very powerful. It's very powerful. I think it helps us take back in a way, in many ways, take back our power that we give away to these specific definitions of success or arriving or, or whatever it is that we, we construct in our minds and then put it as this, as it's far away, it's unattainable or it's only attainable in this particular way. This is bringing, bringing that far away future, that vision that we put so far into the future, it brings it closer. It actually brings it into the present moment and helps us to think about it differently and live into it differently right in the present moment. And I think that that's powerful and ends up giving us a different possibility, a possibility of a different future than what we're imagining right now. Yeah, it really is powerful. I keep thinking we could, we often use it as an excuse too. That's probably my biggest uh, character defect is I'm going to fix the washing machine as soon as I buy the tool that I'm never going to buy. You know, I'm waiting for this tool that I'm never, <laughs> uh, well, I'm going to fix, when's the washing machine going to be fixed? Oh, when I get this tool. Hey, well, have you bought it? No, I, I don't, I'm, I don't plan on buying it. <laughs> and then I, I realized maybe I don't really want to fix the washing machine if I've got this thing that I need in order to do it. And then I'm never going to get that thing. But think about on an unfunny side, life is that we often do that, that I'm going to do something when I get this thing that is never going to come to me. Mm. That just means we're not going to do that thing. But how often is that the same case in life where we think I'm going to become what I want to be as soon as this thing happens. But that thing, we could just use an excuse to think, oh, I'm just waiting on this thing. Then I'll open my business. Maybe the truth is you're, you're scared to open that business. Yeah. I, th I think you're subtly calling people out there. <laughs> me, 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 calling me out. <laughs> no, you're calling all of us out too, because I think that, that if we're honest, there's so many ways in which we do that as well. And, and, I, and I wonder if those are things that we don't really want and we just don't want to admit that we don't want it for whatever reason. Because I, I, I find it hard to think that those are things that we really do want to, to attain those things. Or maybe, or maybe they are. I, I don't know. We might be and we're scared. Yeah. Or we're just, you're right. I wonder how often I'm stringing myself along mm -hmm. thinking I'm going to do this, but the, I, I need a, I, I'm the one who places a barrier that says, I've just got to wait for this before I do that. But I really want to do that. I'm just waiting for this other thing to happen. That's out of my control. Yeah. Something, something to, to think about and question and ponder and, and sit with when we're when we're doing that because sometimes the work to do is to is to drop the, is to admit that we don't want to follow the script maybe it's a script that someone else wrote maybe it's a script that we wrote and we still we and we've decided we want to move on from it and sometimes you just have to say you know what i have to be honest i'm not interested in following this through or seeing this through i want to move on and go on to something else i like the i like your example actually better that she was waiting to become a captain, but what she realized was she didn't want to be a captain. She wanted to be a leader and just started that instead of waiting for this other thing. So maybe the lesson for us is quit waiting for the thing. You can be who you want to be right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, well, she, no. She, well, she, she for sure wanted the title. She wanted to be captain. Definitely. <laughs> but what do you think? But she realized, I mean, I she realized that, that it didn't prevent her from being the thing. And, and I don't know if, if that's in all aspects or all areas of life, but she's, she's just such a wonderful example because it's even in the motherhood part, right? She, she wanted, they wanted to have children, but they couldn't have their own kids, but she didn't let, you know, she, she realized there are many ways to mother and there's so many kids to mother. There are many ways to be a parent other than just this biological parent route. And so if she was like, no, it must be this, it must be this title you know, she would have missed the pos the opportunity to be, be the thing, which is, I mean, being a mother is not just birthing a child. It's, it's the entire lifetime of mothering. <laughs> so, yeah. So I'm hearing another deconstruction. So just like you don't really want to be a captain, you really want to be a leader. You don't really want to have, be a biological mother. You want to be responsible and guide and mentor other people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or Ray, or be responsible for someone else's life to guide someone. So that's parenting. So it's this, that we have too narrowly defined, you know, the narrative of what does it mean to be a leader? We, we've uh, tied that too closely to a title, for example. 
uh, whether it's mother or captain. And I, I want to push up back. You said that she, yes, she did want to be a captain, but when, you know, when we're looking at our last sunsets and someone turns to her and says, if you've become a great leader, if you'd ask them, would they trade that for being a captain? I wonder if they would say, yeah, I still would have rather been a captain. I doubt it. Mm -hmm. I doubt it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not exactly like, but it reminds me of overt and covert goals. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's something that we we talk about in coaching, which is the idea that, you know, overt goals are the goals that we usually scribble down in our New Year's resolutions. You know, they're like those end goals. I want to be a I want to be a captain. I want to make this much money. I want to do this thing. I want to achieve this particular thing. Those are clear overt goals that we have. But our covert goals are how we want are our real goals. And they're often covert, unconscious. And those are the goals that are about how we want to feel. So I, why do you want to achieve this goal? You want to achieve it because it's going to make you feel like an expert or it's going to make you feel powerful or it's going to make you feel like you finally won your father's approval or whatever it is. So we help people to decipher and distinguish and sort of broaden their understanding of what their goal is beyond the overt piece. Like, this is really what you're after. And it sounds like that's what we're talking about here as well. Like, you know, yes, you think you want this particular thing. You think this is your vision, you know, but when we pull back, when we script things out, when we get to a deeper level and layer, we, we see that there's so much more and we're able to see other possibilities, including the ways in which you already have everything that you need right now. And other ways to get there. Yeah. I like, so that, that revealing the covert that's an act of deconstructing. Mm. Another example, someone thinks they want a Mercedes, but what, why, why is it Mercedes? Oh, cause that will mean I have financial independence. Well, okay, boom. There's what you really want is financial independence. And there are other ways to get there. You can think of ways to start putting and acting financial independence right now. So you, you, that's this revealing the underlying, like, so you want this thing, you want to be captain, but why is it? Because you'll feel a sense of leadership and influence over others. Well, then that's what you really want. So it's not a covert, it's just underlying, or we deconstruct that we have this image, but there are, you know, we've pieced together, you know, a narrative that says you got to become a captain, become a leader. Well, we can deconstruct that narrative and say, no, if you're really interested in leadership, there's lots of ways to do that. And you might have the material to be a leader right now. You don't have to wait for someone to give you a title. Mm -hmm. I wonder if there is a sense in which whatever vision you have, whatever dream that you have, whatever thing you imagine, you're imagining it because you already have the materials for it, that those things go together that they're never separate. The, the act of dreaming and imagining whatever it is, is evidence of- Your ability and your materials, yeah. Or you wouldn't have been able to dream it, right? Yes. yes. So here's a sad story. Uh, I remember seeing research done when they asked children from impoverished communities in the United States, what do you want to be when you grow up? They said, I want to be a mail carrier. I want to be a sanitation. I want to work for the sanitation department. I want to be a street worker. I want to drive a subway. I want to drive a trolley car because those are the things they encountered. So that was the limit to their dreams where if you ask upper, I mean, this was not a race thing. If you ask upper class kids what they wanted to be, it was doctor, lawyer, this, these type of answers because they had different references. So mm -hmm. their dreams were limited by what they knew. And I would call that reference. Those were the materials they had. So there is something about expose. I mean, we can expose ourselves uh, and dream bigger, but uh, you know, you're right. We can't imagine dreams for ourselves that we couldn't already achieve. So even I, I guess what we're saying is, even in our dreams are limited by our current abilities and knowledge and skills, uh, but we can bend them and twist them in ways that we find out to dream bigger dreams. I think. Oh wow, that that is powerful. So our our dreams are limited by what we have but we can construct new dreams with what we have that are beyond the dreams that we're currently dreaming. Because you can say you're thinking of using the things you have in order to get somewhere, but you can get somewhere else with those same things, just like the cooking. Like you're thinking, if I give you these ingredients, you have to cook this, but you can actually cook something much more. You can create something bigger than that with what you've got. Mm -hmm. I'll give another example I like to give in class about, uh, just the narratives that we pick up and go by is becoming extremely limited without our consciousness. Uh, you've heard of the glass ceiling, right? 
Yes. This is the idea that women and minorities only get so high in organizations that there's a limit or there's some invisible barrier to their advancement. So they don't get into upper management because of a glass ceiling. So let's say I've got three daughters. Let's say I raise them telling them about the glass ceiling and that, that women and minorities can only get so high in organizations. They can't get into upper management because there's some kind of barrier there. And so my daughter starts to make it in the corporate world, and then she sees a position in upper management. What does she do if all her life she's heard about the glass ceiling? Does she apply? Maybe, maybe not. No. Why? And why doesn't she apply? Well, she doesn't apply because she believes that there is a glass ceiling and she it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Right. That's you're, you're right on. You're way ahead of me. So she doesn't apply because she won't get it. And how many jobs do you get that you don't apply for? Yes, none of them. <laughs> so, so what if she had never heard of the glass ceiling? Would her life and prospects be better? Very very likely because, you know, yeah, because she would have just, you know, there wouldn't have been a, that hesitation to apply, to apply. Here's my question. The, the woman who does apply with the awareness of the glass ceiling, who b- believes that there's a glass ceiling but applies anyway, what is she doing? She's enacting another narrative. That's where, But she's also conscious that – oh my gosh, I was about to not apply, or I believe it, but for some reason, despite that, I'm going to choose not to enact that narrative. So if my daughter never hears about the glass ceiling, that's great. She's got it easier. Mm -hmm. For those of us who have, we have to deconstruct and resist it. Mm -hmm. We have to be conscious of it and think, I cannot enact that one. Because if I I enact the glass ceiling, I'm not going to apply. So if I'm the one, if I go by that narrative, it's going to lead me to not apply. So that's what makes it, the change so difficult. One, we have to be aware of it. Two, we have to decide to not enact that narrative. So what resources can she use, still talking about this, this daughter who is aware of the glass narrative, um, the glass ceiling narrative, what resources does she have available to her that she's going to use to help her? De, you know, deconstruct, reconstruct, and move forward. What what does she what does she have already that's enough? This is really an optimistic side because she doesn't need nothing except not to enact the narrative that's going to marginalize her. <laughs> and we might be enacting narratives that marginalize us because we're not in that story of upper management, and so we don't apply, and then we don't get into upper management. So all we have to do is stop. Hmm. You don't need to go get nothing. You don't need to find something. You just have to stop doing the old way. You don't enact the old narrative. And all of a sudden you have agency instead of thinking, if we think, if, if we go by it, we can pretty unconsciously think it's something outside of our control that, oh, there's a glass ceiling. I'm not going to apply because I won't get it. So we don't apply and surprise, we don't get it. And we don't realize that we're the ones producing our fate. We're the ones producing that. We think, we think the glass ceiling was out there. Meanwhile, we're building it constantly every time we enact it. So when we realize, hey, we're building the glass ceiling, it doesn't exist if, if we don't produce it. And then you just have to think, hey, I don't need to go get something. I don't need to do anything except to quit producing it. So if you spot the old narrative, just don't enact it if it's not good for you. I, I call it stepping over dead bodies. Yeah, or don't get on the bus that's not going where you want to go. Mm-hmm. But to keep getting on the bus that's going somewhere else and thinking, man, why? I just wish this thing would turn. Mm. Quit getting on that bus. I, I like that because I was thinking, okay, so you know, you you seeing this narrative that's not helpful. What do you got to do? You got, and you're like, just stop, stop enacting it because you you don't need to get anything else. To, like, how do we get over the glass? ceiling is a barrier. It seems like there's so much to do, but for an individual, it's easy. Just don't enact it. Don't do that. But that's hard because what did we just say that we're often not aware of it. So the act, the reflection it takes to bring to awareness, a narrative that is marginalizing you is very difficult. So, so, so it's part of the story. It's part of the story, right? Cause I think part of the glass ceiling narrative is that there, there are people's persons, agents on the other side, actually enacting that. So let's say you're in a situation where there is nobody, right? There's no boogeyman. It's just you didn't apply. That's all well and good. You stop enacting that narrative. You move forward and you realize, hmm, there is no glass ceiling in this place where I am. We move forward. We're, we're happy. We're frolicking along. What about when you are in a, in a space where there is a legitimate glass ceiling? It's not just internal. It's not something you've, just something you've internalized or you get over your internal barrier to this thing. You resist that narrative. And you 
you move forward and there is there there are others playing another script like i think that's what you your team face with in the, with the de- death penalty yes with the death penalty like you know there are folks who want to enact it it's not just like you guys were just imagining and you're like if we just stopped imagining this you know move forward so there's something else happening there and i think you've touched on it earlier about well, let's talk let's talk about the two prospects of that uh in the first example remember we just believed in the glass ceiling so we just didn't apply and of course, we don't get the job we don't apply for. And the other one, we don't enact it and we apply for all those jobs, but other people still are enacting the glass ceiling and discriminating. We still, what were, what were our chances in the first scenario? Zero percent. What are our chances if, so it takes a lot of people to enact the glass ceiling. So we can stop, this is making sure our side of the street is clean. We can do our part our chances just doubled. I mean, there are still other people might be enacting glass ceiling and not hiring us, but at least it's not us anymore, not hiring us. Mm. So you're right. We're not curing all the world, but this is where I get mad that we can't just manifest ourselves that I'm just going to manifest myself the promotion. You can manifest yourself an application, <laughs> <laughs> but you can't manifest yourself a job. So, but if you don't apply because you think I can't manifest myself a job, that's a real problem. Mm-hmm. You know, so I, I used to hear this joke that someone's just saying, God, please let me win the lottery. God, please let me win the lottery. And every, every week I don't win the lottery. And you're thinking, God, please. Just, and then one time in the middle of the night, they heard a voice say, Psst, buy a ticket. <laughs> so you do something, you apply, and that still improves our chances. You know, we're, this is not a cure-all. There are other people in the world. You're right. There are circumstances we can't just wish away, but we don't have to add to the barriers. Yeah, we don't have to be part of the narrative that's holding us back, or or we we just don't have to be our own obstacles. We that's that's the least we can do. Yeah, if you're already being marginalized, don't join them and in, and in, in engage in self marginalization. So at least stop something. At least stop some of the problem, especially the part that where you're the problem, where you don't apply. And this is not Professor Hansen saying the glass ceiling is women's fault. <laughs> it is not. It's just that we unconsciously reproduce these things, even when they're bad for us. We reproduce structures that are bad for us. If we become more conscious, we could just think, well, I won't produce. I, I'm going to apply. So I, I don't get to decide if I get the job, but I do get to decide if I apply. And before we were not applying because of the glass ceiling. Now at least we're applying. And if we do that over time, there will be more chances. So we are tipping the scales a little bit. But before we were tipping the skills, I mean, we had no chance. Now we've got a chance. A lot of times resistance begins from within. It's not just a lot of times when we're in movement work or or trying to make some sort of change that we think is out there in the world. We think the only thing that needs to be resisted are obstacles that are outside of us. But sometimes resistance begins at home first. And we can... You know, that's true. Yes. And I was thinking about how do we get people who are reenacting the glass ceiling on the other side? We can just start to share our stories about how I decided not to enact it. And if you get in front of the, if you get an interview, you can say, hey, are there any barriers? You know, a lot of times there are barriers to advancement for women or people of color. And they might think, oh, we don't have any barriers. You might think, uh, has the committee or have you ever reflected on that there might be barriers that you're unaware of or that you might be unconsciously making decisions that reduce the chances that you'll have more women, uh, minority applicants, or maybe they don't feel included so they don't, so they don't apply as often so that you can invite others to engage in self-reflection or try to, this is, you know, you're kicking off a little deconstruction on their behalf by asking them critical and insightful questions. I like that. Asking critical and insightful questions to help others to deconstruct their own narratives and their own scripts to raise, get a sense of awareness about what their scripts might be to start with. Same thing we had to do and then give them an opportunity to just deconstruct. So awareness and then so they can deconstruct. And asking questions. I mean, I think this happens through questions where you ask someone, hey, what's your favorite type of food? And they have never thought about it. And they think, oh, I guess I like Chinese food or I think I like Indian food. So you could ask them questions that that increase the chances that they kick off in self-reflection. Like uh, uh, I, I talk with executives all the time. And I think if you say in my company, everyone has equal opportunity for advancement, do you also ask yourself, are there barriers that you're not sure about? Like single moms, do they have 
things that you're not aware of or covert barriers or things that you need to, and or because the answer is you might have to do different things for single moms to have the same opportunity. So it doesn't mean you're against equal opportunity or giving anyone, every, you, it just might be harder than you think to achieve equal opportunity because for certain groups of people, they might have different barriers before they have the same equal opportunity. So if you want equal opportunity, there might be more for you to do than you think. And just to ask them questions like that. So I get executives, I ask them if you, the, the dangerous ones are the people who just think, oh no, we have equal opportunity because they're not aware of things that, well, maybe opportunities are not as equal as you think. So what I'm getting from this for, for, for all of us is it's so important to know one, that you are running a script, you're operating with a script. We all need to know that and accept that or you're, you're always operating with a script. You need to know what, and then start exploring what is that script? How is that script helping or serving me or hindering me? And how can I recon deconstruct and reconstruct this script in order to move towards and attain the vision that I'm talking about um, or thinking about or dreaming about? And also knowing that this script that I think is limited has limitless possibilities for constructing new scripts that I could as of yet not imagine or not dream. So even as it's limited, it's also limitless. Sounds perfect. What are your final words for us? I feel like we've talked a lot about, I was just going to re-summarize about first becoming aware. I mean, what a huge gain if we just are aware of narratives that we are enacting that might be constraining us and just stop enacting those. I mean, this is so powerful because you're not waiting for anybody else. You're not a victim. You're thinking that, what am I doing that is limiting me? And at least stop that. I mean, that's pretty good for starters. I think I think people would see a lot of dramatic change in their lives. And I am, uh, the last thing I want to say is that none of us are free from this, that I, I can't presume to sit here and teach like, here's what you got to do. That's whenever I say that stuff, I'm hearing, here's what I have to do. And I have not explored enough the narratives that are holding me back or the things that I'm doing that. I am not reconstruct. I am not constructing a new narrative, or, or I keep reconstructing narratives that are keeping where, me at the place where I'm at. And if Hans is still working on this, then we definitely know we're in good company when we get to work on our own narratives as well. Wow, what an absolutely delicious meal of a conversation! Are you stuffed? You should be. We covered a lot. Between this and the last episode, we learned that we're always operating with a script, always, and that we need to explore what the script is and how it's helping or hindering us. And whatever it is, it's about what you've got. It's the thing that's limiting you, but it's also the treasure that's the building block for your vision of the future. Because get this, you've already got everything you need for that future. You don't need to go out and get anything else. And if you dare to create with what you've got without trying to get more, you can create a new vision that you hadn't imagined before, a future that doesn't need you to go out and get new materials. Yes, our script may be limited, but it has limitless possibilities for creating new scripts of things that we have not yet imagined. So what are we gonna do with all of this? Well, a whole lot, but we're going to save that for upcoming episodes because we do not need to overwhelm ourselves. This was a lot to chew on y'all. But for now, I've got two things for you to take on right away to make some use of this and let all the stuff sink in. Remember your assignment from episode 59 where, where I asked you to list out all the things you've got, all your stuff that makes your current status quo? Well, I want you to go back to that. So take it out and have a look at it. Just read over it and ask yourself this question. If I can't get anything else other than what is here, if this is it, if I'm limited and constrained to what is here, what can I create? What can I create with what I have and only what I have right now? Sit with that question for a bit and chew on it. Hmm. Yes, I know your mind is already cooking up a yummy and unique meal. I look forward to hearing about it. The second thing I want you to do is to listen back over these two episodes 
59 and 60 and really sink into the conversation. There's so much that Hans and I covered that I'm going to need to unpack elements of it for episodes to come. So I need you to fully soak it in with me. So you got it? Two things, look over your list from episode 59 and ask yourself, what can I create with what I have and only what I have right now? And then revisit these two episodes to let the message sink in. Oh, wow. We've got so much great stuff coming up, my Creating Maven. I can't wait. Let's go. See you soon, Creating Maven. And remember to ask yourself, what can I create with what I have and only what I have right now.